at Fajr, what would he recite in the first rakah? Surah Al-Sajdah, which he also used to recite before going to sleep. So if you develop the habit of reciting that surah or listening to the surah before you go to sleep, inshallah within some time, you will have parts of it memorized which you can recite in Fajr Salah on Friday. Otherwise, he would also recite Surah Qaf. Which surah? Surah Qaf. Are you familiar with that surah? There is beautiful recitations of that surah available. You can listen to them over and over and make sure that you memorize at least half of it, some of it, so that you can begin reciting it. Similarly, we learned that the Prophet ﷺ also used to recite Suratul Mu'minun in Fajr Salah. I'm talking about Fajr only right now. Because this is Quran al-Fajr, recitation of Fajr. So he would also recite Suratul Mu'minun. And if you look at it, the beginning ayat of Suratul Mu'minun, they're very beautiful. They mention the various characteristics, the qualities of true believers. So if you memorize those ayat even, even if you don't know the entire surah, at least you can recite the beginning ayat in your Fajr Salah. Similarly, we learned that once the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Al-Takweer, which is not that long. And I'm sure many of you also know that surah. So Surah Al-Takweer, he recited that surah as well in the Fajr Salah. We also learned that once he was traveling and he recited Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq and Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas. So during travel, he recited very short surahs. So this shows to us that if at times we don't have much time, or perhaps we are not feeling well, or we had a very difficult night, and we're not able to recite longer surahs in Fajr Salah, then we can also recite shorter surahs. And in that also, if you follow the sunnah, there is double reward. Then also we learned that once the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Zilzal, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا In both the rakah. In the first and second rakah, both of them he recited Surah Zilzal. So, make a list of these surahs. If you know them, try to recite them in Fajr. If you do not know them, next time you want to memorize a surah, make sure you do them, inshallah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the tahajjud prayer. That, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ And from the night, فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ Pray with it, meaning pray with the Qur'an, meaning in the tahajjud salah as well, you should recite the Qur'an. And tahajjud salah is what? Nafila. It is a voluntary deed. However, on the Prophet wasallam, according to one opinion, it was obligatory. So, what do we learn from this? That tahajjud salah is all about reciting the Qur'an. We learned that the Prophet wasallam was commanded, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ Tartila. Recite the Qur'an in Tartil. When? In your Salah. So we see that the major recitation would be done in Tahajjud Salah by the Prophet ﷺ. So this is also something that we can do. But a person may wonder, I do not have the Qur'an memorized. I only know a few surahs. So if I wish to recite Surah Al-Baqarah, if I wish to recite Surah Ali Imran, how can I do that? How can you do that? In the Nafal Salah, remember, you can recite the Qur'an from the Mus'haf. You can open it up and you can recite it from the Mus'haf. You cannot do this for Fard. Okay? You cannot do this for the obligatory prayers, but you can do this for the Nafal Salah. How do we learn about that? What's the evidence for that? We learn that there was a person during the time of the Sahaba who knew how to read. He knew how to read. However, he did not have the entire Qur'an memorized. So he would lead some people in prayer. How? By reading off of the Mus'haf. Because he was able to read. And he would only lead them in prayer when it was nafil, not mandatory. So because it was done at the time of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, this shows to us that it is correct to do so. So similarly, if you do not know the entire Qur'an, if you do not have it memorized entirely, then you can recite parts of it in your tahajjud salah. And this is one of the best things to do. You know, as we're studying through the Qur'an, we continue onwards. And what we have learned in Surah Al-Baqarah, what we have learned in Surah Ali Imran, it's possible that we have forgotten it. And sometimes we want to go over, we want to recite again, but with all the chaos of the day, with the children and with the noise and with all the work, sometimes it's very difficult. So if you develop this habit, that you get up for your tahajjud prayer 15 minutes before fajr begins and you read two pages only two pages 
One page in first rakah and the second page in the second rakah. This is an excellent way of revising the Qur'an. And you see, it's a constant habit then. And this will continue for the rest of your life. Because unfortunately for many people, their connection with the Qur'an lasts only until they're formally studying it. And afterwards, it comes to an end. But if we develop this habit, that it's a part of our daily routine to recite the Qur'an, to continue going through the Qur'an, then inshallah our relationship with the Qur'an will be a constant and a permanent one. For example, in Ramadan, in the Taraweeh prayers, because again, it's nafil. So if the imam is reciting and you wish to follow along with the mushaf, you are allowed to do that. But make sure it's only the Arabic mushaf. There is no translation because many times what happens, your eyes wander off to something else. Okay? So make sure it's as plain as possible, as clear as possible, and only the Qur'an. When you go into prostration and you have the mushaf with you, what do you do with that? One of the best things that you can do is stand next to, let's say, you know, a table or a dresser or something like that. If you can put a stool next to you so that as soon as you go into rukur, you can put the mushaf over there. And then you can go down into sajda easily. You can do the rukur easily as well. Because if you're carrying it while you're doing rukur, it would be difficult. How are you going to put your hands on the knees properly? How are you going to be able to stand up properly? So it's best to put the Qur'an on a stool or a table. And in fact, you also get these stands on which you can put a big mushaf so that you don't even have to hold it. And your hands are, you know, where they're supposed to be in salah. So if you have one of those, use them. I know somebody who uses a music stand. You know the music note stand? They had one of those. And that's what they would use for their mushaf. They had a huge mushaf which they would place on it. So if you have an opportunity like that, you know, get something that is similar and you can use that inshallah. Now it depends how big the mushaf is. If it's small and light, you can just hold it with one hand. And you can have your hands on your chest, folded the way you were supposed to during salah. And with just your thumb and your, you know, your index finger, you can easily hold the Qur'an. And if you find that to be difficult, you can hold it with one hand if it's heavier. Try to get a small, light Qur'an. Inshallah, that will make it easy for you. And sometimes you also get um, just one juz, right? So you can also hold that. So find out what works best for you. Try different things. And where there's a will, there's a way. We listen to the recitation of these ayat and we'll move on. أقم الصلاة لدلوك الشمس إلى غسق الليل وقرآن الفجر إن قرآن الفجر كان مشهودا ومن الليل فتهجد به نافلة لك عسى أن يبعثك ربك مقاما محمودا Okay, let's continue. Ayah number 80. وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَدْخِلْنِي And say, O oh my Lord, admit me. Where? مُدْخَلَ صِدْقٍ A sound entrance. A sound place of entrance. Admit me over there. وَأَخْرِجْنِي And cause me to exit. مُخْرَجَ صِدْقٍ A sound exit. وَجَعَلِّي And grant me. مِنْ لَدُنْكَ From yourself. Sultan al Nasira, a supporting authority. This ayah was revealed with regards to the context of Hijrah, the migration. Remember, the surah is a Makki surah, and it was revealed towards the end of the Makkan period. And in the previous ayat, we learned that the mushrikeen, they were about to uproot you from this land. And if they were to do that, they would not stay over here after you for long. And in this ayah, the Prophet ﷺ is being given the command to migrate from Makkah to Medina. So he is told, وَقُلْ and say, make dua, Rabbi, O oh my Lord, أَدْخِلْنِي You admit me. You admit me where? Into Medina. What kind of entrance? Mudkhal an entrance that is صِدْقٍ of truth. Mudkhal is understood in two ways. First of all, mudkhal is zarf, meaning a place or time. So mudkhal, a place of entrance, time of entrance. And secondly, mudkhal is also mastar. What does it mean then? 
entrance, entry. And Sidq is primarily truth. But you know that the word Sidq is also used for honor. It is also used for when something is sound and safe, when something is pleasing, when something is good. As we have learned earlier, Anna lahum qadama Sidqin. So admit me into a place of entrance, meaning into Medina, that is Sidq. That is good for me. That is pleasing for me. Sometimes it happens that you move to a place, you go to a city, you go to a particular place to do some work, or you shift to another house, and what happens? It doesn't turn out to be as good for you. So, admit me into this place and make it Sidqin. Make it honorable, make it good, make it pleasing for me. And mudkhal may also refer to that make my entrance into that city good and honorable. Because many times it happens that a person enters a place, but he has to fight so much in order to get inside. Or he has to undergo so much humiliation. For example, it's possible that a person arrives at a particular country, at a destination, and he has a lot of trouble at the immigration. It's possible, right? And it takes hours and hours for him to get through. So, mudkhal sidqin an honorable entrance. And the Prophet ﷺ was given such entrance into Medina. We learned that when the Prophet ﷺ was entering Medina, how the people of Medina, they had gathered up together, and each one of them was eager that he should stay at their house. Each and every single one of them. Inshallah, in Sira, you will learn about the migration of the Prophet ﷺ. So this dua was granted. وَأَخْرِجْنِي And take me out. Bring me out. From where? From Makkah. How? Mukhraj and exit. That is Sidqin. That is sound. Again, Mukhraj will be understood as a place of exit and also a way of exit. And exit, that is Sidqin. Sound, good, pleasing, with khair, with goodness, with afiyah, with protection, with well-being. Waj'alli and make for me, meaning wherever I am, Wherever I enter into and whatever place I leave, make for me min ladunka from you, sultanan and authority that is nasira, helper. Meaning, provide me with a helping authority any place I go and any place that I leave. As I mentioned to you, this ayah was primarily revealed with regards to the context of hijrah. So when the time of hijrah was near, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to make this dua continuously. Because he was about to leave a city and enter into another city. Others have said that this is referring to that Adkhilni, admit me into Makkah when I come back again. And this entry should be of honor, of dignity. And as I'm leaving this place, as I'm leaving Makkah today, make this exit honorable for me as well. So this is referring to Makkah only. And according to others, is referring to Medina and Makkah. Others have said that over here, Mudkhal, it refers to the grave. It refers to the grave. And Mukhraj refers to this dunya. That when I have passed away from this world and I'm admitted into my grave, make that entrance an honorable one, a pleasing one, a beneficial one. And when I'm leaving this dunya, make my death, make my departure also an honorable one, a respectful one, with good deeds. Thirdly, it is also said that mudkhal sidqin refers to Jannah. That let me enter Jannah, how? With honor, with dignity. And mukhraj sidqin refers to the plain of Hashr the gathering place on the Day of Judgment. Then when I leave that place and when I enter into Jannah, make my exit an honorable one. Others have said that this can be understood in a general sense as well. This ayah can be understood in a general sense as well. What does it mean? That any place that I enter, make my entry an honorable one, a successful one. And any place that I leave, make that something good for me. Make it an honorable, a good, a pleasing, a beneficial experience for me. Many times it happens that you enter into a place, you walk into a building, you walk into a center, you go to a wedding, you go to a party, you go to the mall, and you end up 
seeing something or doing something or hearing something that is very upsetting. And you leave that place with a very heavy heart. You wonder, why did I even come here? Such a waste of time. Isn't it? Sometimes you go to do some work, you're trying to buy something, but you can't find it anywhere. You spend hours going from one store to the other, and you cannot be successful. So every time you enter into a place, make this dua. Every time. That, Rabbi adkhilni mudkhala sidqin, wa akhrijni mukhraja sidqin. Anywhere I go, whether it is the bank or it is the school or it is the masjid or it is you know, the store, the library, anywhere I go, make my entry and make my exit good and beneficial and honorable. وَجْعَلِّي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانًا نَصِيرًا And provide me with a sultan and nasira wherever I am. What does a sultan and nasira mean? Sultan, as you know, has several meanings. And one of the meanings is a hujja, a clear evidence. A clear proof. So, provide me, give me sultanan, an evidence, a proof that is nasira, that is going to be an aid for me. Like for example, you go somewhere, you walk into a party, you go to a wedding, you're sitting over there, you end up meeting someone, and you start telling them about the Quran, for example. Some conversation comes up, you start telling them about the deen. Now what happens at that time? It's in your head, but you don't have the evidence. You know what to say, but you don't have the evidence. So whatever I'm saying, wherever I am, provide me with some evidence so that I am able to convey successfully. Secondly, Sultan and Nasira. Sultan also means quwa, strength. So make for me, meaning provide me, with a quwa, with a strength that is going to be my nasi, that is going to assist me, that is going to be of assistance to me. Like for example, when the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Makkah to Medina, in Medina who did he find? His supporters. Those people who supported him, who aided him. And who were they? The Ansar. Similarly, you go somewhere to do some work, but you don't find anyone to help you. You feel so weak. You feel so helpless. So provide me with quwa. Provide me with strength, with means of support, wherever I am, whatever I am trying to accomplish. Thirdly, Sultan also means hukuma, authority. It also means authority. So wherever I am, provide me with Sultan, meaning with authority, meaning that I am victorious in whatever I have gone to accomplish. Sometimes you go somewhere. You wish to do something. You wish to finish off a task. You wish to complete it. But you don't have the authority over there. So provide me with authority as well. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he went into Medina, he was given Sultan as well. He was given authority as well. Because Medina became the first Muslim government. So this ayah, it teaches us a very jami' dua. A very comprehensive dua. And it's relevant to every situation of our lives. Every situation. When you walk into the classroom, when you leave, when you walk into an examination hall, when you walk in to do any work at all, when you're sitting in the car, when you're leaving the house, anything that you're doing, anywhere you're going, make this dua. Seek Allah's help. The Prophet ﷺ was taught this dua. And the same we should also benefit from. وَقُلْ and say, جَاءَ الْحَقُّ The truth has come. Meaning, when you enter Makkah at the time of conquest, then what should you say? جاء الحق The truth has come. What is الحق? الحق is the truth which is firm and stable. It can neither be weakened nor can it be eradicated. Nor it can be destroyed. It is firm. It stays. It is established. So the truth has come. The truth about which there is no doubt and the truth which the people have no power to resist. And what does this truth refer to? The truth of Al-Islam, Al-Quran, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this truth has come, وَزَّهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ And the falsehood, it has departed. It has vanished. It has disappeared. Zahaqa from the root letters, Zay Haqaf. And we have learned this word earlier, وَتَزْهَقَ أَنفُسَهُمْ And their souls depart. 
So zuhuq is basically when something passes away, when something leaves with sorrow in a very pitiful state. And zahqun nafs is used for death. Because at the time of death, the person's soul is defeated by the angels. No matter how much the soul tries to stay in the body, it cannot resist the angels. It is defeated. So it's taken away with defeat. So was zahq al-batil. The batil, the falsehood, it has been made to go, it has departed, it has vanished, it has been defeated. Why? Because falsehood is the opposite of truth. What is al-haq? It is that which is stable. And batil does not have any stability. Why? Because it has no foundation whatsoever. In al batila indeed the batil, kana zahuqa, it is bound to depart. Zahuq is from the root letters again. Zahi haqaf and zahuq is fa'ul, mubalagha, meaning one that is bound to pass away. It can never ever stay. So what does a battle refer to? It refers to a shirk, the worship of the asnam, a shaytan. Al-Bukhari has reported that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, the Prophet sallallahu he entered Mecca at the conquest of Mecca and around the house, meaning around the Kaaba, there were 360 idols. Around the Kaaba, there were 360 idols. And the Prophet ﷺ began striking them with a stick that was in his hand, and he was reciting, جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوقا. So when you enter Mecca, at the time of conquest, say this, recite this. Because falsehood, it can never stand against the truth. It can never remain firm. Once the truth comes, falsehood leaves. Therefore, man's success lies in what? In accepting the truth, in holding on to the truth, not in holding on to falsehood. Now a person might say, in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ Falsehood has departed. And at that time, yes, it meant idolatry. But we see that so many people worship multiple gods today. So it hasn't really departed then. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ So how do we understand this? You see, what it means by the departing of batil is that batil has been defeated. Falsehood has been defeated. Because when does someone depart? When does something leave? When? When it's been defeated. When it has nothing else to do over there. So it has been defeated. It has been proven wrong. And its aib, its faults have become very clear. Because at the conquest of Makkah, what happened? The truthfulness of the messenger was made obvious. And the falseness of shirk was also clarified. From that point onwards, people knew that the haq was tawheed and the battle was shirk. وَنُنَزِّلُ And we sent down مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ From the Qur'an. And we sent down from the Qur'an مَا That which هُوَ شِفَاءٌ It is a healing. We send down of the Qur'an that which is a healing. What is shifa? Shifa is cure, remedy. A cure for what? A healing for what? Some disease, some kind of illness. And remember that illnesses are of various types. Some are physical and some are spiritual or you can say mental or psychological. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we sent down the Qur'an that which is a shifa, a healing. And it is warahmatun and a mercy. But for who? Lil mu'mineen for those who believe. And those people who do not believe in the Qur'an, those who do not give the haqq of the Qur'an, وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ And the Qur'an does not increase the wrongdoers, إِلَّا خَسَارًا Except in loss. What do we see in this ayah? That the Qur'an is a shifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Min over here has been understood in two ways. First of all, it has been said that min over here is of bayan, meaning it is explanatory. So what it means is that the entire Qur'an, all of the Qur'an is a shifa and a rahma. Every letter, every ayah, every surah of the Qur'an is what? 
it is a shifa and it is also a rahmah. It's a cure and a source of mercy. Others have said that this min is of tab'id. It gives a meaning of some of. So it means that parts of the Qur'an are especially shifa and rahmah. The entire Qur'an is beneficial. However, some parts of the Qur'an especially, they are a shifa, such as Surah Al-Fatiha. It is a shifa. Similarly, Ayat Al-Kursi. And there are other parts of the Qur'an, other verses in particular, which are known as Ayat Al-Shifa. So this Qur'an is a shifa, and it's a shifa for what? First of all, it is shifa for dalal, misguidance. Because you see, misguidance, error, being astray, not knowing what to do, this is also an illness. How is it an illness? Because then a person is not functioning properly. He does not have the right focus. He does not think correctly. So first of all, in the Qur'an is a shifa from what? From dalal. How? Because in the Qur'an there is huda, there is guidance. Secondly, the Qur'an is also shifa for illnesses, for diseases. How? Because in the Qur'an is barakah. However, it is only a shifa and rahma for who? For those people who believe. And those who do not give the haqq of the Qur'an, the zalimin, it only increases them in loss. The more they recite the Qur'an, the more they listen to the Qur'an, the worse they become in their state of heart, in their state of mind, and also in their physical state. You see, there are two types of illnesses that human beings may suffer from. What are they, first of all? Physical. Which are such illnesses that are related to the physical body. Like, for example, a person's blood pressure is not normal. Sugar levels are not normal. Or, for instance, a person has been bitten by an animal an insect, and because of that, you know, his body is hurting, his body is swollen. Similarly, it could be a physical injury, like a broken bone. Various types, they're all related to the physical body. Any physical pain, physical pain that a person suffers from, what is it? A physical ailment, a physical illness. Another type of illness that human beings suffer from is that which is spiritual. That disease, that ailment which is related to the heart, the mind of a person, or you can say the psychology of a person. This includes diseases such as nifaq, hypocrisy. It includes diseases such as extreme love of this world. It includes diseases such as the love of fulfilling desires. Every desire a person has to fulfill. It includes diseases such as anger or jealousy. And it also includes mental illnesses, psychological disabilities. Like for example, clinical depression. Depression is what? It's a mental illness. What else? Okay, for example, split personality disorder, personality disorders. Similarly, anxiety, anxiety disorders. What else? Phobias, eating disorders, OCD, Obsessive compulsive disorder in which a person, it begins with constant waswasa that a person is doing wudu and he's like, I didn't wash my hands and he continues to wash his hands or he feels that his hands are still dirty or he feels that you know his body is still unclean so he keeps on washing himself again and again. He feels that najasa is still on his body. So there is various types of mental, psychological, you can say spiritual ailments. And we see that both of these diseases, they are connected with one another. Why? Because the body and the soul, the body and the mind, they are intertwined with one another. They together form a human being. If only the soul is there, would you call that a human being? No. Similarly, if only the body is there and there is no soul inside that body, would you call that a living person a human being? No. Both the physical body and the spiritual being, both together form a human being. They are both connected, intertwined with one another. So if one is suffering, automatically the other will also suffer. This is automatic. 
Like for example, if you're ill, if you're sick, and you've been sick for a week, will you not become sad? Isn't it so? Similarly, if a person has had a physical injury, which is why they're not able to go out of the house at all, they're completely immobile, will they not get depressed? Of course they will. Which is why people who are ill, it is our duty that we must go and visit them regularly. Similarly, if a person is is suffering from a mental illness, is it not going to affect his body? Of course it is. You see, sometimes when you are concerned, when you're worried, when you're anxious, you end up getting a headache, or you end up feeling as if you're something's happening in your stomach. So, all of these diseases they are interconnected as well. And it is necessary that when a person is ill, whether it is a mental illness or it is a physical illness, he must cure himself. He must find the cure. Why? Because when a person is suffering from either of these diseases, what's going to happen? It's going to affect his productivity. It's going to affect his ibadah. If your body is hurting and you are sad at the same time, how can you pray? How can you recite the Qur'an? How can you give sadaqah? How can you go and help the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You cannot do that. Isn't it so? How can you study and gain more knowledge of the deen? You cannot do that. So you have to seek the cure because it affects your productivity. It affects your ibadah. And we have been created for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu said, Seek medical treatment. For Allah has not created any disease, but He has also created a cure for it. Seek medical treatment. The Prophet ﷺ commanded us. So any illness that a person is suffering from, he cannot say, oh, it will go away itself. What do we have to do? We have to find a cure and cure ourselves. Because for every disease, there is a cure. Except for one disease, which is? Which is? Death before death. Old age. Unfortunately, people are trying to cure that as well. So we see that when people become ill, it's only natural for them to seek the cure, to cure themselves. And people from various backgrounds, various experiences, various cultures, you know, they cure different diseases differently. Isn't it? Like for example, for some things you have home remedies. What you consider to be a remedy, if you tell your doctor... They'll be surprised. They will say, no, don't even dare do that. But you say, no, no, my parents have always done that. We know this works. You know, you doctors, you have no idea. People have such beliefs, right? Because depending on the background of a person, he treats illness differently. And we see that different types of cures are permissible as long as they are halal, meaning if it's something oral, it should be halal, and it should not contradict the sharia. Like for example, a person is not seeking help from others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us a shifa. There are many cures that are out there. Many people will give you cures. You're suffering from something, people will say, eat this, eat that, do this, do that, go to this doctor, go to that doctor, try this treatment. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us a cure. And that cure is the best cure. And what is that? It's the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an, it cures physical ailments and it also cures spiritual and mental and psychological ailments. What's the evidence for that? We learned that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he reported that some persons from amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they set out on a journey. And they happened to pass by a tribe from the tribes of Arabia. And they demanded hospitality from the members of that tribe that they should be received in as guests, they should be allowed to stay with them for a night or two and so that they can eat over there, they have a place to stay. And this was a practice that was very common amongst the Arabs. But what happened? The people did not extend any hospitality to them. And so what happened? The Sahaba, they just camped close by, they weren't welcomed in as guests, they were there. Very soon, the chief of that tribe, he got bitten by an animal. So what happened? The people, they tried everything, but they weren't able to cure that chief. So they came to the Sahaba. And they said to them, Is there any raqi amongst you? 
Raqi is someone who recites and then blows for the purpose of cure. Duqiya. As the chief of the tribe has been stung by a scorpion. So a person amongst us, meaning the Sahaba, he said yes. So he came to him and he practiced the Ruqya with the help of Surah Al-Fatiha. And the person became completely fine. He recited Surah Al-Fatiha and he kept on blowing. And what happened? His pain completely left. He was completely fine. And as a gift from the tribe, he was given a flock of sheep. Before, they weren't even willing to welcome them in as guests. But now they gifted them a flock of sheep. So the Sahaba, they went to the Prophet ﷺ to make sure it was okay for them to receive the flock of sheep. And he said, of course it is. And he said that, take out of that and allocate a share for me along with your share. In a way that it's completely permissible for you. And it is said that when they told the Prophet ﷺ, he smiled. And he said, how did you come to know that it can be used as ruqya? It's only natural, right? When you believe in the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is cure, then you will use it to cure yourself. And Ali radiallahu anhu, he said that the best cure is the Qur'an. And you will see many times, many times, physical ailment, it can be cured with ruqya. Recently somebody was mentioning to me about one of their very close relatives is suffering from cancer. Last stages. It was diagnosed very late and last stages, very, very late stages. And basically the doctors had given up. The person was in ICU and they started reciting the Qur'an day in and day out constantly on the person who was ill and they informed me that Alhamdulillah he is recovering already he's not a hundred percent but Alhamdulillah he is recovering along with that they are even giving him different types of treatment but Alhamdulillah he is improving whereas the doctors had completely given up there was no chance of survival it was completely last stages so we see that for physical ailments as well the Qur'an is a cure. But for who? For the one who believes. Lil mu'mineen. For the one who has a strong iman. If you look at it, it can be any part of the Qur'an and it can also be certain parts of the Qur'an. Especially those parts for which we do find evidence from the Qur'an and Sunnah. Like for example, from this incident we learned the truth al-Fatiha is a shifa It works. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he would recite the mu'awwadatayn. Whenever he would go to sleep before that, he would recite the surahs. Then we also see that the Qur'an is a cure for spiritual and mental, psychological ailments as well. What's the evidence for that? We learned that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, No person suffers any anxiety or grief. So what are anxiety and grief? In other words, depression. And says, Allahumma inni abuduka. That entire dua, and at the end, what do we learn? أَن تَجْعَلَ الْقُرْآنَ رَبِيعَ قَلْبِ وَنُورَ صَدْرِ وَجَلَاءَ حُزْنِ وَذَهَابَ هَمِّي وَغَمِّي That, O oh Allah, you make the Qur'an the life of my heart, the light of my breast, and a departure from my sorrow, and a release from my anxiety. So the Qur'an, when a person recites it, when a person reflects on it, then what happens? It gives him relief from the sadness that he's experiencing. And we also learn in Surah Yunus, Ayah 57, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nas, qad ja'atkum maw'ilatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudur. The Quran is what? It is a shifa for that which is in the sudur. What is in the sudur? All of these feelings and anxieties and worries that people have. So, what's the cure for that? The Quran. I'm not saying that other cures should not be adopted. Yes, they should be used. But along with them, we should not ignore this cure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Because, وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلَ Who is more truthful than Allah in statement? If Allah is saying this Qur'an is shifa, then this has to be shifa. Because the shifa that people present, many times there could be problems with those. There could be side effects of those. But the Qur'an is a natural cure is the most effective cure. No side effects whatsoever. And it's the most effective. Because you see, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He is a shafi He is the one who gives cure. Just recently, this lady was telling me about how she had had several miscarriages. Every time she would conceive, she lost three babies like that. 
And then eventually through treatment, she became pregnant and her pregnancy was very difficult, complete bed rest. And eventually, alhamdulillah, she gave birth to a healthy child. And then again, she underwent some treatment and became pregnant again and gave birth to her second child. Basically, the doctors told her that you cannot conceive on your own. You have to take fertility treatment every time you wish to have a child. Now, what happened with her was that after some time, she began feeling upset in her stomach and she felt as though something was wrong. So she went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, it's, it's no big deal. If you really want to make sure you're okay in there, I'll send you for an ultrasound. So they sent her for an ultrasound and they found a baby inside. She was six months pregnant. Six months it was an amazing thing. It was a shock for the doctors. It was a shock for her because the first two pregnancies, she was constantly on bed rest. Constantly. And she had no idea that she was expecting. And she was six months. And alhamdulillah, no complications, no problems, no morning sickness, nothing whatsoever. Because shifa is in the hands of who? It's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this lady, she was saying constantly, you know, when I conceived, at that time, I was coming for the Dawra Qur'an regularly. I was coming and listening and attending the Qur'an class every single day. Allah is the one who has given me this gift. So if a person has his yaqeen that Allah has shifa, He will give the shifa, this is a shifa that Allah has given, He will use it and He will benefit from it. You see, many times, cure has a lot to do with your thinking. If you believe that cure is in this medication, it will work. And if you are certain that it's not going to work, it's just sugar pills, it's just white balls, then it's not going to work. You have to be very, very confident in the cure that you're taking. And we see that those people who read the Qur'an, who study the Qur'an, there are two types that we learn from this ayah. First of all, some people, they get shifa and they get rahma from the Qur'an. Shifa and rahma. But who are they? Those who believe. And the second type of people are who? The zalimin. What is ghul? Naqs. To reduce the haqq of something. So those who do not give the haqq of the Qur'an, and remember there are many hukuk of the Qur'an, many rights of the Qur'an. First right is to believe in the Qur'an. Another right is to recite the Qur'an. Another is to reflect upon the Qur'an. Another is to act upon the Qur'an. And another is to pass on the Qur'an to other people. So a person who gives the haqq of the Qur'an, he will get shifa from the Qur'an. He will get his energy from the Qur'an. And those who do not give the haqq of the Qur'an, for them the Qur'an becomes a means of loss. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا The more they read, the more they suffer. The more they study, the more they doubt. The more they read, the more depressed they become. Why? What's the reason behind that? They are not giving the haqq of the Qur'an. So if you want to benefit from the Qur'an, what do you have to do? Give it its haqq. Recitation. وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَدْخِلْنِي مُدْخَلَ صِدْقٍ وَأَخْرِجْنِي مُخْرَجَ صِدْقٍ وَجَعَلْ لِي وَجَعَلْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْ سلطانا نصيرا وقل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوقا وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا خسارا You see, if a person is using the Qur'an to cure himself, it takes time. Because, for example, if you want to do it with Surah Al-Fatiha, you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha over and over again. And you have to do it with a lot of conviction and concentration, focusing on every word, feeling it, you know, saying it with your heart. And it's difficult compared to just putting a pill in your mouth. Isn't it? It's more challenging. But the more yaqeen a person has the more effect the Qur'an will have on him. Unfortunately, we are ajul, we are hasty. We want immediate relief. Whereas the fact is that if you want long-term relief, then you have to cure the problem, not suppress it. Recitation. <laughs> 